from like 3500 BC until like almost 2000 BC is the Uruk period. The major gods that were there was originally, it was An, who was the Sky Father. He's got the first temple early on in Uruk is the temple to An. Mm-hmm. And An becomes El. An is the same as El of the Israelites. Utu is the, the sun god, is Inanna's brother. Sometimes he's called Shamhash later on. I mean, this is frightening stuff. I mean, they are a frightening mythology. And the Phoenicians, the Greeks and Romans said that the Phoenicians were like really superstitious. It's kind of a paradox. It reminds me of modern day America. On one hand, they were the most sophisticated people of their day, but they had this really backwards religion and they were really locked into this old, super superstitious stuff. I learned both what is secret and what is manifest. For Sophia, the fashioner of all things, taught me. For in her, there is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique. For Sophia, because of her pureness, she pervades and penetrates all things. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. Today I'm blessed by the presence of Edward Dodge, author of The God, the History of the Goddess from the Ice Age to the Bible. So I'll go ahead and check that out on Amazon. And we're going to continue off our conversation from last week about, there it is, about goddesses. And how it leads up to the monotheistic age. It all plays in. It's all an evolution of ideas. But it goes back to this ancient matriarchal religious era, which we talked about last week. So if you haven't seen that, go check that out. But now we're going to get into Ishtar, who is the pinnacle of all goddesses. She's the Babylonian goddess of the Ishtar cult, also the Inanna cult, and how they relate to each other. And how they lead into the how they relate to the Bible. So I'm going to toss it right over to you, Edward. You can just take it away. All right, thanks, Neil. You know it's great to be here. Thanks to be with you again. I enjoyed the conversation last week and looking forward to uh, continuing it. So um, yeah, so we wanted to today. We're going to talk about Ishtar. She is really the um, she was the queen of heaven, and she was the most popular deity in the ancient Near East. And she's she is in the Bible. She's called Astart in the Bible. King Solomon worshipped her. Um, and then they call her Ashtoreth, which means shameful Astart. And so we'll get to why, they, why they're shaming her. But that's the end of a long story arc because she has many names and she is um, the chief deity in, in many really important traditions. And she was the chief goddess of really the biggest, most important cities of the Bronze Age. So we're going to take it back to the beginning. And I think this is really the beginning of the... Uh, uh, the biblical narrative, frankly, I think this is uh, takes us back to 4000 BC. This is which is not coincidentally the same age when the biblical b- biblical storyline picks up when they say this is creation was 2000 years before Abraham. So that's 4000 BC. So the 6000 year young earth is 4000 BC. Um, what that is historically is just the beginning of the Bronze Age, just before the, the end of the Neolithic and just before we transition into civilization in going back to Mesopotamia and Sumer, um, so the oldest places in, in Mesopotamia. And in these places, they'd been Neolithic for thousands of years at this point, and they are getting, um, and these cultures are egalitarian, they've got strong goddesses, the women are have strong rights, um, the women are um, have a lot of leadership positions in, in this society. And so as we transition, though, into the Bronze Age, now we start getting to a point where the uh, the settlements have become prosperous, and they've got a certain amount of wealth enough that's like worth stealing. And they also, as we get into bronze, they invent weapons, um, and also they start to corral horses so that you can have chariots. And so, with all these three things, with the bronze and the horses and chariots, now we see the beginning of the Indo-European invasions and the rise of the warrior kings and the shepherd kings that start to assert themselves over society and start to assert themselves over the women in particular. Um, And this is where we see the beginning of kingship. Like kings don't go back to forever. There's a certain moment in time when we have the first king and like, and he's a warlord, basically. These are war kings, they're all warrior kings. They're they're guys who came in by force and take over a city 
and um, um, you know, and start to lead it by you know by force. And so this all begins in like in the fourth millennium BC sometime. By the time we get to 3500 BC, that's the beginning of Aruk, which is uh, which is in the Bible. Um, it's called Eric as well, like E R. It's U R U K or E R E C H in the Bible. I've, and this heard, was, I've heard a theory that Iran, Iraq, Arabia, those are all originally based. Those are all were called Urak, Arabia. The Ur and the R are related. They're caught. They're they're just different. Yeah. It's just a different language with a different uh, alphabet. So yeah, that, Uruk and Iraq. I mean, it seems like yeah. a pretty obvious connection. Yeah. I'm no expert on the etymology, but it seems yeah, yeah, like yeah. a connection. <laughs> but, but go ahead. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, so Uruk is really interesting. I never knew about this until I was doing this research. It's the first like real city in the history of the world. It's the first city in the history of the world that we would call like a major city. Like that has a modern urban um, environment and it has a recognizable political leadership. Urban. Yeah, urban. I wonder if that's yeah, like urban, right? Um, there you go. <laughs> and so this is the first major urban center, and it was the dominant power. It, it wasn't always the king. It wasn't the you know the 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 place the palace of the king would move around over the centuries. But Uruk for like over a thousand years was the biggest and most like culturally important city in Mesopotamia for like from like thirty five hundred BC until like almost two thousand BC is the Uruk period, and this is when Uruk was the biggest most prominent city. There's other important cities too. It's not the only one, but it was the biggest for sure. And the major gods that were there was originally, it was On, who was the sky father. He's got the first temple early on in Uruk is the temple to On. Mm -hmm. And On becomes El. On is the same as El of the Israelites. So this is the original sky father and he's got the first temple. And it's a really cool temple. It's called the White Temple. And it's built on like an early ziggurat, so it's only one level up. It's not multiple layers. I and actually, I actually it, know one word in cuneiform, one pictograph, and that's the Anu. It looks like a circle. It looks like a. I'm showing. I'll show it on the screen right now. Okay. But it looks like a little circle with little slashes. Like it means An or Anu. That's right. what I mean. Okay. It's, it's actually yeah. the word for sky father or sky. So you can use it in two different contexts. You can use it for the word sky. Or you can use it for on, but go ahead. All right, there you go. So he was the high god in Uruk, and he was the one who was worshipped first. We know this because he's got the first big temple. And it's like the first, well, I don't want to overstate the case, but anyway, it's the first like really big temple in Mesopotamia where like it's like a kind of like what we would call like a temple to an anthropomorphic god, like the Bronze Age gods. And it's really cool. It's like, I don't know if it's glazed in marble or something, but it's gleaming white and it stood above the city and you could see it from miles away and it sort of glinted in the sun. It's like it was famous and cool. Um, and so originally he was the high god. But then after a while, they built another ziggurat, a bigger one. And this one was to Inanna. And they, and she becomes the chief deity of Aruk. And they tell a story of how Inanna stormed the heavens and stole some of her father's authority, and which he grants her. And then she becomes the queen of heaven and she takes power. And they've got another story where she gets she goes out with Enki, who's another one of the creator gods who's a god of wisdom and everything. And he's got the Mies, which are the divine laws. And she meets up with Enki and she gets him drunk and, and she steals the divine. Like she asked him, can I have the divine laws? And he says, okay. Cause he's so wasted and he loves her because everyone loves Inanna because she's the love goddess. So they don't have sex, but it's like, it's always a seduction with her. Right. Um, and so he gives them to her and then she runs off with the divine laws to bring them back to Aruk to make Aruk the most important city. And when he wakes up, you know, hung over, he realized what's what's ha what's happened, that she's gone off with him and he tries to get him back, but it's too late. And she gets him back. There's a whole story about it. And she gets them back to Aruk. Um, and so she becomes the high goddess, Anana. And so this translates to like, uh, you know, I'm a jealous god. I have no other gods before me. This is where Anana literally becomes the most popular deity um, and the high. And, and she was the goddess of love and war. She is like, not she's like Aphrodite, but she's got way more powers than the Greek Aphrodite. So the Greek Aphrodite comes from this model, but the Greek Aphrodite is um they took away all of her like powers of war, all the powers of divination. So Inanna has all these extra powers. She's like Aphrodite and Athena combined. So she is um Venus is the morning star and the evening star, and it's the third brightest planetary object after the sun and moon. Right. And so um so it's really important. And so 
daytime is for love and night or nighttime is for love and daytime is for fighting. And she, you know, she leads everyone into battle and she is um, like the Ishtar temple. Like you would go there. The warriors would go there before battle to get their divination and prophecy and like be guided into battle and get the consent of the priestesses and be like told, like, is this a good idea to go into this fight or not? And they would get all the divination done and make a decision to go. And then when they came back from the battle, they would go back to the temple and there the priestesses would like heal their wounds and give them medicine and maybe sex and whatever they needed to want. They had a ritual of it called washing away the washing the war out of man or something like that. And it was a ritual they would have. They would go to the temple before the battle and then come back to the battle, go straight back to the temple. So it's like deeply wrapped up in their traditions. Um, and Ishtar symbolizes like everything in women that's not maternal. Like she doesn't have any babies. Like there's so many stories about her. Sometimes she has babies, but the oldest ones like of Anana, she doesn't have any children and they call her the virgin because that means that she's childless and unmarried. doesn't mean that she's chaste. Like back in the day, virgin did not mean never had sex. Virgin meant an independent young woman who was not married and didn't have any children. So, um, so Inanna is called the virgin. Other goddesses are called the virgin. The priestesses are called virgins. And then children born to the priestesses in the, in like the, uh, in a, in a temple sex, ritual sex would be said to be virgin born. And they're like the children of heroes. Sargon of Akkad was virgin born like this. He has no father. Um, because they're born to the women, to the priestesses during the rituals. And he's also famous for being the one who is told that he's put adrift in a basket by a common woman's mother, or I think. Well, his mother's a priestess. Priestess, and, priestess. and then, then he, go, he goes up the stream, and then who takes him in? Uh, Ishtar takes him in. Ishtar, wow. And, and, and then he is blessed by Ishtar to become the gardener to the king, and then he takes over and becomes king. Um, but like the, or the cup bear or something, he's got like a Royal patronage. Um, but it's the same story as Moses is what you're getting at. It's the Moses story is. before Moses and Sargon of Akkad was the first emperor. And so like the first military emperor, like everything begins in Sumer, right? Like this is like the book, the famous book history begins in Sumer, right. like all of our Western civilization, the first city, the first military empire, the okay. first emperor, every single one of them is in Sumer. Our math system that we use today, the 60, 60 seconds. Basic minute, math comes from there and 360 degrees. Area. Yeah, that's yep. that, that's never been changed, really. You know, Our astro our basic astronomy came from there, also from Egypt, but, these, but the Babylonians were really good at it. Um, a lot of things they invented. I'm not sure about base 10 math, but definitely the base 6 math. 60, uh, 60. That's, what I, that's what I was saying. Yeah, and... Uh, Oh, a bunch of things. You know, they invented the city. Like, basically, all our sort of basic forms of governance. Um, like I said, like, that's, it all goes back to them. They invented writing. They invented cuneiform. They did, they give us our first pantheon of the gods. The lunar calendar as well. Which the lunar is calendar? Ishtar, I believe. Well, well, she's, I'm not sure if it's how it's based off Ishtar. I, I know there's some relation. Well, the there. lunar is more feminine because it's tied yeah. to women's menstrual cycles and stuff. So, like. Yeah, yeah that's what it is, yeah. So and the lunar is going for the women. I think Ishtar is one of the months, so it's Tammuz, and that actually got that actually got brought down to the Israelites, but that was a Babylonian calendar. Right, and so this is it is, and you're speaking to one of my points here is that we know that Ishtar and Tammuz is part of the Israelite tradition because Tammuz is the name of one of their months. July. So it wouldn't be a month on the Hebrew calendar if this wasn't like one of their pagan gods from back in the day, yeah. and Tammuz is a husband of Ishtar, so. Tammuz, um, yep. Tammuz is the one who dies. He's the agricultural god. It's uh, weird. He's the shepherd king. Tammuz is the first of the shepherd kings. All right, so we're going to get into her story here. Go ahead. All right, so um, so we've established Anana. She was, originally, she's Anana. Then she takes some of her father, steals some of her father's thunder to become the high goddess of Aruk. Um, and then um, she gets all the divine laws and then and then we get Tammuz. Now we or it's originally it's Demuzi. In the Sumerian versions, his original name is Demuzi, and then his name changes to Tammuz. So it's Inanna and Demuzi in the oldest story. And the first story about him is how he is called the courtship of Inanna, where he has to win the love of the goddess to become the king and steal her love away from the shepherd. Or she's in love with the farmer. And so the story starts that uh um Utu is the the sun god, is Inanna's brother. Is that his name, Utu, right? Um, sometimes he's called Shamash later on. Um, Which is the sun, the, the, the word for the sun in Hebrew, Shamash. 
Yeah, he's the brother of Inanna and Ishtar. And he's like they're they're pals. Like they go around and do stuff together. Interesting. And so and so um <clears throat> Uh, Utu approaches Anana and says that he suggested she that she marry the shepherd king, Tamuzi, Tammuz. And she says, I don't want to marry the shepherd. I already love the farmer. The farmer gives me everything I need because these are farm these are the the farmers and the shepherds are the two different groups of people that are rivals. And so she's from the farmer communities. And but the shepherds want in. The shepherds are coming in from the outside. They're the nomads living outside the settlements, and they want to come in. They're also the ones who get the weapons and force their way in. And take over and so but what you see in this courtship of anana and demuzi is is this moment where mythologically speaking when they come together when the shepherd comes into the community and so he's got to go he goes into this competition with the farmer anana says i don't want to go with the shepherd uh i love the farmer the farmer gives me all my lentils and my beans and my and my beer and everything i want um and uh and anana and Demuzi, the shepherd, says, well, I, I can give you more things than, than the farmer can give you. I'll give you. If he gives you beer, I can give you cheese. If he gives you milk, um, or I can give you, he because the, the shepherd can give him cheese and milk and wool. And so he lists all the offerings that he can give Anana, and the farmer lists all the offerings he gives. They have kind of this contest, and eventually Anana says that she chooses the shepherd. She likes his offerings, and so... Tammuz celebrates and he, he jumps up and down that he's won the heart of the goddess and he approaches the, the, the farmer uh, and Kimdu, I think is his name, and, and, and wants to quarrel with him. Says, hey, you know, I stole your woman, man. What do you think of that? And the farmer's like, um, it's all right. You know, you can have her. I'm kind of like been there, done that. She's a demanding mistress. Hey, you watch out <laughs> because you might. She's a bit of a handful. Um, so you can go ahead and have her, pal. And in fact, you can come in and you can you can graze your animals on my on my fields. And you're welcome to drink out of the water out of our canals. And you're welcome to join our community. And the and Tammuz, the shepherd, says, "Thank you, friend. You'll be the honored guest at our wedding." And then they go and have the wedding, um, and it's all a big celebration. And then, and then there's this whole part of the ritual of the sacred marriage where when she grants her love to the shepherd, now they come to bed. And it's this very sexual, it's very graphically, it's like I quote it in the book, it's like this whole, um, it's like a graphic sex scene. All right, so this is uh, from the, uh, the myth of the courtship of Inanna. And so we, we're, this is this scene, we're starting with uh, Inanna is talking to her brother Utu, the sun god. Brother, after you've brought, your bridal, brought my bridal sheet to me, who will go to bed with me? Utu, who will, who will go to bed with me? Sister, your bridegroom will, will be with you. He who was born from a fertile womb, he who was conceived on the sacred marriage throne, Demuzi, the shepherd, he will go to bed with you. Anana bathed and anointed herself with scented oil. She covered her body and with the royal robe. She, she arranged her precious lapis beads around her neck. She took the royal seal in her hand. Demuzi waited expectantly, expectantly. Inanna opened the door for him. Inside the house, she shone before him like the light of the moon. Demuzi looked at her joyously. He pressed his neck close against hers. He kissed her. Let the bed that rejoices the heart be prepared. Let the bed that sweetens the loins be prepared. Let the bed of kingship be prepared. Let the bed of queenship be prepared. Let the royal bed be prepared. The bed is ready. The bed is waiting. What I tell you, let the singer weave into song. What I tell you, let it flow from ear to mouth. Let it pass from old to young. My vulva, the horn, the boat of heaven, is full of eagerness for the young moon. As for me, Anana, who will plow my vulva? Who will plow my high field? What? Who will plow my wet ground? As for me, the young woman, who will plow my vulva? Great lady, the king will plow your vulva. I, Demuzi, the king, will plow your vulva. <laughs> then plow my vulva, man of my heart. Plow my vulva. O oh, lady, your breast is your field. Inanna, your breast is your field. Your broad field pours out plants. Your broad field pours out grain. Water flows from on high for your servant. Bread flows from on high for your servant. Pour it out for me, Inanna. I will drink all you offer. I bathe for the wild bull. I bathe for the shepherd Demuzi. Now I will caress my high priest on the bed. I will caress the faithful shepherd Demuzi. I will decree a sweet fate for him. Um, all right, it goes on, all right. One last bit. The queen of heaven who has presented the sacred measures by Enki, Inanna, the first daughter of the moon, decreed the fate of Demuzi. In battle, I am your leader. In combat, I am your armor bearer. 
to in the assembly, I am your advocate. On the campaign, I am your inspiration. You, the chosen shepherd of the holy shrine. You, the king, the faithful provider of Aruk. You, the light of An's great shrine. In all ways, you are fit to hold your head high on the lofty dais, to sit on the lapis lazuli throne, to cover your head with the holy crown, to wear long clothes on your body, to bind yourself with the garment of kingship. Yeah, and it goes on. Um, but yeah, it's like totally explicit. Oh, yeah. Plow my vulva. Um, there's other stuff like that. Enlil stuck in his penis and roared. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, in the in the epic of Gilgamesh, Enkidu is also in that story. Oh yeah, no, we're gonna get to that. So that's that's actually a different character. It's spelled differently. It's there's an M. The oh, farmer okay. character's got an extra M in it, so a different guy. Oh, okay. But anyways, I was just gonna say, I'm not even gonna get into that story, but I want to say it does get graphic in there too. I mean, there's they're sending like hookers. Oh, yeah, no, that's the next chapter. So, um, so all right, no, actually, the next chapter. So this is this real, quick, real quick. Did you notice that they said Inanna, the first of the first daughter of the moon? Yeah, you know, there's all these different. Um, Inanna does not have clear parentage because there's all these different stories about her, and so like everybody takes credit for being her parent. So like there's, she's got um, every different tradition tells the, her parentage differently. Interesting. Uh, um, so in the next chapter, so this is this is the beginning of the Shepherd Kings. I say this is like this is where Tammuz and the Shepherd Kings come in mythologically, and you know and gain the kingship. And so in that in that in that's uh, that whole thing is like the sacred marriage ceremony where the where the the priestess and the goddess anoint the king, and it's an annual ritual they do every year, where uh, you know it's presumably a sex ritual where they've got to go behind closed doors and and please the priestess and prove the king's got to prove his virility. Um, so the, the king has got to come on like hands and knees begging the goddess to become, to be approved, to be queen, to be king. And this speaks to these older, older matriarchal traditions where the women were respected and the women had a role in choosing and selecting the king because like, uh, you know, the women, you know, at that time the women were still listened to. Mm -hmm. Um, but as time goes on, the men throw off the women so they don't have to listen to them anymore. Um, because in the next story, so in the beginning, Anana and Demuzi are all like lovey-dovey and sexy, and uh, it's all going good. But the next story is Anana's descent to the underworld. Right. And I, did a, I did a whole video about this. Right. And so this is the famous um, cycle. This is one of the cycle of life traditions. And in this one, Anana is not satisfied. She's stolen some of Enki's authority. She's stolen some of uh, An's authority. And now she wants to go down and steal her sister. Her sister is a Reshkigal, the queen of the underworld. Right. And so Anana wants to go take over the underworld too. She wants all the power for herself. She is like ambitious and won't listen to anyone and won't be told no. And is like, wants everything, all the power and glory for herself. She's not satisfied with anything. Like, you know, this is not a, a goddess of the patriarchy. This is a goddess who's challenging everyone. Right. And so, but one of the rules in mythology is that even the gods have to submit to death. You see it in the bail cycle too. And so when Anana goes down, it's a long story. I don't want to go, go into all the details, but as she goes down, like her sister knows what's up and is waiting, is kind of like waiting for her. So there are these seven gates. I was just going to say, isn't, doesn't she go down because Tammuz dies? No, Tammuz dies afterwards. This is before. You know, like, this is before Tammuz dies. Okay, go ahead. I want to hear this. I, I, I have a, I have a Oxford classic that I read, but I, there's so many different tablets. There's so many different versions. There is multiple it. versions of these stories, and you will see different translations, especially yeah, online. Tablets. They didn't have books back. You, literally, you can go to one area in Iraq and find a tablet there. You can go to an area somewhere else and find a different tablet somewhere. And they're very, they're all similar. They all have the same characters. They all have the same. Kind yeah. Of, but you'll see though there will be things different from from there from one Absolutely. to one. Absolutely. But but and you'll so, see translations be done differently. Yeah. So I'm I'm not going to challenge your. I'm, I want to hear you, what you think. Oh no, th no, this is no. no Tamuzi's death comes next. That's Act Two. So in Act One, Anana goes down and she wants to become queen of the underworld. Um, and there are these seven gates you got to go through. So Arishkagal sends her um, vizier to go, you know, meet Ishtar at the gate and tells Ishtar that. Uh, so at a certain point, after Anana's name changes to Ishtar after you get after Sargon of Akkad comes through um, and they become the Akkadians. Um, so now it's Ishtar. And um, when she approaches the gates 
at each gate, the vizier tells Ishtar that she's got to remove one of her articles of clothing. So first comes off the crown and then the jewels and at each gate and eventually she's got to take off her robes. And so when she gets to the seventh gate and each of these is totally symbolic, there's all this like laden with meaning and symbolism for each of these gates. And you could go and do a whole hour on each one. Do you, do you know the deepest? So I've read a lot of commentaries on this. And one of the most popular commentaries about this is this is a representation of fall time when the plants start to die, when the when everything starts to die until you get to the winter time. And then but so that's what's happening here is each article of clothing is like life dying is like animals stop giving birth. Uh, the trees start lo losing its leaves. Uh, plants start dying. Water stops raining. Snow starts coming down. That's what this is symbolic for. And then as she comes up, which is gonna we're gonna get into later, that's when springtime happens. Is now now the plants are coming back again. So that's what they're, that's what they're saying. No, I mean these are absolutely cycle of life and cycle of nature season rituals. A hundred percent. Like these are totally about the seasons and the turning of the seasons. Um, and so when Nana goes to this or Ishar goes to the seven gates, by the time she gets to the seventh gate and meets her sister, she's stripped naked and she's furious. You know, she feels insulted and um but she still has her plan she still intends to do what she's going to do but um you know her you know Ereshkigal like isn't going for it and then the Anunnaki are there and it's not clear precisely who the Anunnaki are but they're like judges and they might just be the other high gods for all I know um that might just be the best explanation and anyway they say you know that you cannot take over for your sister um and the penalty for Ishtar's uh, transgression is death and so they kill her and Ishtar dies and they hang her on a meat hook and her corpse is hanging in the underworld um, and this sends all of life similar to the story of Demeter and Elysian Mysteries it sends all of life into a drought and famine and all life dies and and specifically they say that all sexual activity stops and so yeah. um, nothing is being born this is winter time this is and the winter time this is midwinter, though. This is like January now. But this is like the you know a, a destructive event, right? A mythological right, right, event, right, right, right? And then some of the versions of the story will have that um, Ereshkigal goes into agonizing pain as though she's in labor. Um, uh, but so I missed. A, I just forgot a bit. There was before Ishtar went down below. Ishtar's got a, a faithful vizier of her own, um, Ninshaber, I think is her name. Who's a who's a female goddess that's that is like the faithful aide de camp to. Uh, Ishtar. And so Ishtar had told her, if I don't return in three days, again, you see the three day thing coming. Right, right, um, right. If I don't return in three days, go visit the other high gods and see if they will rescue me. Go first to Enlil, who's the king of the gods in that era. And if he doesn't help you, then go to An. And if he doesn't help you, then go to Enki. And he'll be sure to help me because Enki, you know, Enki likes me. And so, uh, so, so Ninchaber does this. And she sets up a morning, you know, she goes into her morning thing with a sackcloth and, and uh, drums and stuff. And she goes and visits the high gods. And Enlil says, no, you know, Ishtar, that's her problem that she went down there. She shouldn't have done that. An says the same thing. He, An's not one to intervene. An is the creator of the universe, but he doesn't intervene in people's affairs. Um, but right, Enki right. does. But Enki is the kind god. Enki, um, he will intervene for anybody. If you ask Enki for help, even if you're a total criminal, he'll help you. He'll help anybody, yeah, that because he's kind, and that's just the way Enki is. Um, and so, if you ask Enki appropriately, Enki is the one who tells I can't remember the person's name, but the flood myth, the pre Noah flood myth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Enki's the one who tells him to build the ark. Right. Totally. So there you go. Just add to what you're saying. Yep, and that's just one example of many. And um, and so um. So she goes to Enki and Enki says, uh, it says, oh, my goodness, you know, the queen of heaven, what will happen if everything if she's lost? We can't have it. Enki realizes it's a tragedy and they have to get her back. So he creates two uh, sexless eunuchs. So here you get the transgender priests coming in, um, two sexless eunuchs that he creates. Um, they, they've got names for them. And he sends them down with the, the food of life and the water of life to rescue Ishtar. And so they're led in to the underworld. Um, and they find a Ereshkigal in agony, like as if though she's going to give a birth, but she, but she's not even pregnant. And so she's like, yeah, have at it. You know, you can, you can have her. Um, and so they sprinkle on the goddess, the water of life and the, and the food of life. And, and Ishtar is revived. Um, so Ishtar wants to go home, but there's rules to the underworld that 
she now has to provide a replacement soul. She can't go home. Uh, she has to provide something in replacement for herself. So Ishtar leaves and they send these demons to follow her to make sure that she it does good on her, um, on her, you know, it's, she's bound by honor to do this by the rules of the underworld. She has to do it. So these demons are, are right on her heels. And so as Ishtar goes up, the first goddess she comes across is, is Ninchabur, her faithful vizier who honors her and everything. And so Ishtar says, no, I'm not going to send her down. And they meet some other gods and they honor Ishtar and they've been mourning. So Ishtar, you know, honors them and go by, but the, but the demons are unrelenting. The demons are like, we need, you got to send somebody down for us. So Ishtar goes home and this is where she finds Tammuz sitting in Ishtar's throne, relaxing, having a good old time. He's not mourning anything. He's got some slave <laughs> girls dancing. He's really? wearing his best outfit. He's throwing a party. He's having a good old time. And, uh, and he's sitting in Ishtar's throne and Ishtar is just enraged. She is just white hot with, with rage. She cannot believe that not only is he not mourning her, because it's, it's still within the mourning period. They're supposed to be, uh, you know, I don't know how long they will mourn for, but he should be he should be wearing sackcloth and be God, scraping his body. You know, not he shouldn't be getting oiled up with a bunch of you know uh, concubines. You know, yeah, it's supposed to be like a month of mourning for for cases like that back then. Yeah, no. yeah, you know exactly. Yeah. So um, so Ishtar is outraged. So she says, "Him, you can have him." And then Demuz, he's like, "Oh my God, Demuz." He's like, no, he's 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 terrified. And he sees these demons and they're not like looking very friendly at all. So he runs off. He takes off in, in fear and he goes and pleads his case to Utu, his brother-in-law says, please help me. Um, and Utu tries to help him. Utu like turns him into a gazelle and he runs off, but the demons keep catching him. And then the story goes on. There's actually like the continuing adventures of like uh, Demuzi as he like changes form from one thing to another to try and escape these demons, but they finally catch up to him and they beat him up and they take him to the underworld. And that's the end of Temuz almost. Um, yeah. So, so, okay. So let me ask you this because it's not over. Okay. Go ahead. Finish. Go ahead. I'm going right, to so then my question for the end. So, um, so then, so then he goes down and then Ishtar, um, then now Demuzi also has a, as a, a sister of his own and a mother of his own. And they're like also agricultural deities. Um, I think her name is Geshtanana or something. And um, Ishtar feels bad afterwards. She 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 regrets what she's done. It was uh, she did it in haste and she was mad and she feels a little bad that you know he now he's been sent to hell and like you know um, you know I did love him once upon a time and you know maybe I shouldn't have you know maybe I she was a little harsh. So she's 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 weeping. So the women weeping for Tammuz is this part of the ritual where the women start mourning Tammuz, and there's a whole setup for this. There's a yeah, this is a big deal. What you just said, a, this was a yearly right. ritual around I think October or something like that. It's a but, new you know whatever you no know, they it comes in different parts of the year depending on which culture you're talking about. Sometimes yeah. in the fall, sometimes in the spring. Right, the um, weeping for Tammuz. Maybe it was maybe it was springtime. The weeping made him come. Back. Either it was spring or fall. It was one of the two. But I know for a fact this was a big deal. And the reason why I'm saying this is because in the Bible, in Ezekiel, they Ezekiel talk about too. the weeping of Tammuz. Now listen to this. The weeping of Tammuz, they're talking about the ritual of the pagans. And they're saying, and the, and God says to Ezekiel, in the future, you're going to see abominations. They call it an abomination because it's pagan. He goes, you're going to see abominations way worse than this in the future. Now check this out. There are Jewish scholars who say that this is a prophecy about Christianity. The weeping for Tamos <laughs> being the weeping for Christ. Wow. Now you can't bl now you can't blame him for going there. And like th think of it. Imagine putting yourself in the, in the shoe of a Jew and you're reading well, Ezekiel and you're thinking a worse abomination. What could be worse abomination than weeping for a pagan god? Weeping for the Christian God who claims to be our Messiah. That's even worse of abomination. So you have to you have to give him credit. It's a beautiful interpretation of Ezekiel for in the eyes of you know, it's just funny. It's fun to, to hear those things. But I'm going to let you continue this story. Well, one more reference before we go on is that Ishtar is the whore of Babylon from Revelations. Whore of Babylon was a title. It wasn't an insult. That was like her proudly worn title. She was a holy harlot, a holy prostitute, the courtesan of the gods. She, they celebrated that stuff. So after Aruk, she became the chief goddess of Babylon. 
She was a chief goddess of Nineveh, which was the Assyrian capital. And this relates to this relates to the Romans big time because Julius Caesar, who is the Augustus father-in-law, they said that this was a line born from Venus, who was Ishtar. So yeah, who was Ishtar, the, exactly. The son of Venus, who is Julius Caesar, is the son of the whore of Babylon. So the reference in G Revelation is saying the Caesarian line is the is the king being born from a from a woman who who, who bores the it's the great abomination the whore of babylon that's what revelation is about so it's all it all plays together all these mythologies kind of intertwine in yeah ishtar is like so key she's like this central underlying theme of this of like all this meta narrative um of the whole like this whole religious conversation taking place over centuries um so we're back to the women weeping so the women were weeping for tammuz and this is where they're feeling regretful and Ishtar regrets and is feeling sad. And so they come up with a deal. I'm not sure the details of how they do it, but uh, Geshtanana agrees. Tammuz's, Tammuz's sister, Geshtanana, agrees to be a substitute for him half the year. And so that he can come back up half the year and Geshtanana goes back half the year. And that's how he comes back. And so that's how he becomes a dying and rising god. Um, and he's the oldest one that we know of just because the Sumerians invented writing and so they get the first go at writing down these traditions. And so um, this is the oldest version of, of that tradition, which then there's many, many, many more versions afterwards. Um, fascinating. Um, I, I, is, that, I, did you, is that where you want to stop for a second? For that story, yeah. I mean, that's okay. the end of that story. Okay, and that's, and that's fascinating. And I'm glad you want to stop there. But I do want to ask you, so the I I have a, a amateur copy. It's this. It's this little Oxford classic paperback book. And it starts off after that because it does start abrupt. You can tell there's a story. This doesn't say once upon a time. It just starts off and it's like in the land of no return. Like they're just starting off Christians. You can tell there's more behind in front of it. Right. Now this starts off. This Descent of Ishtar version starts off Tamos dying and then Ishtar going down. And then she gives off her clothes just like you said. But but it's funny because in the beginning it says, I'm going to go avenge Tamos. And then when I bring him up, the, the dead shall, I shall rise the dead. Actually, I'm going to read it for you. It's right here. It says, um, it says, I shall raise up the dead and they shall eat the living. The dead shall outnumber the living. And so she's basically saying, so she does. Okay. So she goes down and she does exactly what you said. She brings off her clothes one by one. She gets Tamos, she brings him up, and then they anoint him with oil. Huh. She, she's the one anointing him with oil. And it's funny because Tamos is always being anointed with oil. What is that? It's funny because the dying and rising gods are always anointed with oil. Messiah it means anointed. There's definitely right. a connection there. I haven't put my thumb on why, but there's something going on there. Tamos being raised from the dead is bringing the dead with him. And it's springtime, so there you go. There's your spring equinox, which is Easter, three days of a descent of Inanna. That's from the other story. And then you got him being anointed with oil. It all, all the num, all the, all the, the, all the numbers are hit. Basically, you like you're, like you're drawing numbers, like playing a uh, lottery. They're all being hit every right. single. And these are these yeah, are it's all these it's all these motifs that repeat over and over again. And I would love to talk to some scholars that are more knowledgeable than me about you know these Mesopotamian myths because I do I by no means know them all, and I do think that there's like different um, interpretations. So I would love to get some more you know granular detail on on some of this stuff. But the basic Not gist of it, moment. I think you know is, is is you know is this dying rising god tradition, and then Ishtar's ambition, um, and the fact that. You know, at, at every moment of the story, Ishtar is the dominant character over her husband. And that's a kind of a key thing, a key fact. subtext here. That's a she, fact. she chooses him. He's an uh, idiot. <laughs> she sends him to hell. Um, she raises him back up. At every point, the, the goddess is more powerful than her husband. Yeah, she's the hero. And he's kind of just she's like the hero oh, of the story. And, 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 and even when she is the one acting badly, like she's still the protagonist of the story. She acts badly and trying to challenge her sister like, Ishtar doesn't really have the right to do that, but she's just so ambitious that like she won't be, you know, she's just power. She's just so vain for power and glory. So like even though she's like the uh, kind of misbehaving, she's still the protagonist of the story. And she's still the the one putting all the events in in action. Everybody's reacting to her. Um, now, now she's this, the central figure. 
she definitely is. She's definitely the savior of this religion. So there's all these gods, there's creator, there's Anu, the creator, there's Enki, there's Enlil, there's all these different gods. But she is by far the savior archetype. She's the one that is like the hero, the big hero. Um, yeah, she's the goddess of pleasure. You know, this is a world that like, you know, survival is like pretty thin, you know, pretty meager. These people live pretty hard and they have these hard agricultural lives. And then the reward comes from visiting Ishtar, where she delivers everything that's beautiful and abundant and joyful and pleasurable. Everything in life that, is, that you enjoy comes from her. She is the beautiful flower. She is the sexual pleasure. She is the abundant harvest. All of it, it, it all comes from her. And that's right. why she's so popular. So that part I like. And then the part of like delivering knowledge and delivering wisdom and the arts of civilization, that's where I talk about... Um, Ishtar being like Aphrodite and Athena combined because Athena is the goddess of wisdom and civilization and weaving and all the practical arts. Um, all that stuff was associated with Ishtar. Um, how Ishtar is like Athena and Aphrodite combined. There you go. Um, with the arts of civilization, weaving. Um, all of that was in was in Ishtar. And divination and prophecy that goes to Apollo. All of that's in Ishtar. And she's a queen of heaven, which goes to Hera. And she's got the cycle of life ceremony that goes to Demeter. Like she is like the super goddess. All the Greek goddesses like all combined into like nearly into just one super goddess. Yeah, this is it's just fun to look at this stuff and to like and and analyze it and try to compare it to now and to look at it as like a progression over time. Where is the human psyche going? Are we going to a better place? Do we come from a worse place? Did things get better in certain areas? I think there was a golden age in humanity. I also think that it was a time when male and female sort of co-opted the power structure and it wasn't just a patriarchal system. I think, I actually think that, and I just, I used to not think this, but now I do. I actually think that we descended backwards when we got to the church era. Well, I mean, in certain respects, I mean, this is a thesis of mine is that, you know, monotheism is, religion that is hostile to the mother um and they've been spent 1500 years trying to stomp out anything that expresses these traditions at all and that's included a lot of wisdom and knowledge and astronomy and science that the church was totally hostile to you know it's an illiterate age you know they didn't promote literacy they didn't want people reading the bible like i don't know the church's history is pretty brutal um but the next chapter in after after that for ishtar is the epic of gilgamesh and I'm not going to go to the whole epic of Gilgamesh, but just to hit a couple highlights, um, you know, you know, Gilgamesh is this rough and rowdy king of, of Uruk. And again, we're back to Uruk. Um, and both Demuzi and Gilgamesh are listed on the king's list, sort of like in the early phases. So like they may or may not be real people. Um, Demuzi, maybe there was a king named Demuzi who was named after the god. Who knows? Um, but these names do show up on the king's list. So it does give some implication that... Um, you know, there's some, there's something behind him, but at any rate, you know, Gilgamesh is this rough, rough and rowdy. And then they, the, the gods make this character Enkidu to be his, his mate, you know, to be his match. Who's the wild man who lives out in the, in the forest running with the animals who's uncivilized. And then they send out the, uh, Shamhat, the, uh, or what's her name? I think her name is Shamhat, uh, to who's, uh, you know, the Kadesha, the temple priestess, the temple harlot to go have sex with, uh, Enkidu and to civilize him and this to me speaks to like the way a, a girl a woman will civilize her boyfriend you know because like any young man who's you know lived as a bachelor living like a slob who then like gets involved with a good woman who you know fixes him up and gets him to like take care of his clothes and his appearance and everything and civilizes her man to like behave like a civilized guy and be a grown-up and rewards him by like he gets laid every night by like doing a good job and looking good. So the man's like looking good and feeling good and getting rewarded with it every day. Right. And, like that's what like a good woman will do for a guy. Um, and that's what these relationships I think speak to. Um, some of that anyway. Um, you know, gender roles when when done right. Um, and so um, Ishtar is so impressed in the epic of Gilgamesh. Um, Ishtar is so impressed with Gilgamesh and all the stuff they're doing, stuff he's doing, thank you do that uh, she tries to seduce Gilgamesh and she says, hey, you know, you want to touch my vulva? And uh, and um, Gilgamesh says, you know, 
what could I possibly give you that you don't already have? And then he goes through listing all these, her past lovers, including Tammuz, um, all of whom were like, she kind of abused and treated poorly. Yeah. And, you know, because she's like totally promiscuous and any lover that takes too much of an attachment to her, she can be cruel to and like, you know, kind of blow them off. And sometimes, you know, she turns them into like goats and things. Um, so he goes to this list of her past loves and the sparrow, how the sparrow was doing all these things for you, but you broke his wing. And then the gardener, you turned him into a, a gnome and, you know, all these people that loved you. And then you, you injured them somehow and treated them to end up with these tragic fates, including her, your one and only husband. Gilgamesh right. is like, why would I want to go to bed with you? Like, I, you've already got everything I could offer you and I'm going to end up in some terrible fate and insults her basically. Mm-hmm. And so she's outraged. She's like, how dare you say this? And she says, you know, lies and transgressions. And she goes up to her father on and she's completely furious. And she demands that, you know, he, that he give her the, the bull of heaven. Otherwise she'll rip open, as you were saying before, she'll rip open the, the gates to the underworld and the dead will outnumber the living. And I will mm-hmm. destroy everything. If you don't let me give me the bull of heaven so I can go destroy Gilgamesh. And so An's like, well, I don't want you doing that. So he gives her the bull of heaven and she goes and sends it down to sick Aruk. Um, and he goes tearing stuff up and knocking, you know, bashing the walls. But then Gilgamesh and Enkidu go fight the bull of heaven and they kill it. And they kill the bull of heaven. And the gods are all outraged by the by this transgression. And but they like argue back to the gods, and Ishtar comes down to visit them, and they 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 tear the leg off the bull of heaven and they hit Ishtar in the face with it. Enkidu throws the, the leg up and smacks Ishtar right in the face with it. And he says, I would do more to you. He's like super insulting. Um, <laughs> Sounds like it. And so again, she's completely outraged. But um, the gods' response is that Enkidu must die. So they kill Enkidu. And then Gilgamesh, who's just basically, he's basically like, they might be gay lovers for all we know. Um, he's like a total bromance. Nice. Um, and... So then this is what Gil- Gilgamesh is upset about immortality and he goes on his quest to find the tree of life so that he can be immortal. Um, and the story goes on and I don't want to do the whole Gilgamesh story, but the, the, this part, this, this whole beat here where they insult Ishtar is a key turning point because like the Muzi before is, you know, coming on hands and knees begging for Ishtar's grace and love. Um, and all the Kings before are all celebrating Ishtar, but now we see to see a, see a turn. Gilgamesh not so much. He's like, he's gonna challenge the goddess. They're starting to, they're starting. You're starting to see it in the mythology that uh, they're losing some of their power, and you and and you can see in the laws that you know the the kings would write the laws on these steles, like Hammurabi's the law codes of Hammurabi from Babylon from around 1800 BC are the most famous. Or the Urnamu was even before that. Right, that's what I was gonna say. They're neither the first nor the last. So there's actually a whole line of these. Yeah, and you can see, and they talk about the sanctified women, the Kadesha priestesses, and there's some other ones too that are non-sex priestesses. The Naditu were uh, also sanctified women, but they were involved in business. They weren't involved in sex. Interesting. Um, but these women, you can see how they've got property rights that are laid out in law, and you can see over the progression of the centuries that they lose some of those rights. And you could do all, somebody should do a whole scholarly paper just like on the progression of the laws because you see them have less and less property rights and stuff. And then by the time you get into uh, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy um, bans them, says flat out, you you should not allow your daughters to become Kadesha at all. And so when you put all these lines, all these lines of of law codes in, in a row with the laws of Deuteronomy at the end, you can see this progression of where the women ultimately lose their power altogether. Yeah, that's it's interesting how that works. Like, why, why do you think I mean, my actually, I have a theory on that. I think that as warfare started to get more and more advanced, it became more and more of a cultural way of life. Like we don't we don't sack that city, we don't eat tonight, we go poor, we go into famine. So as that became the thing, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, these war ages, that's when men start to really rise up and use their strength to try to. That's exactly what I believe. It's exactly yeah, that's, my theory. That's, that's got to be what happened. But what happened as, as a mistake, and, and we paid the price for that because we lost a lot of wisdom as that. We became this macho, like Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great. Yeah. And we just lost our, our touch, our loving touch. We lost our, 
desire to do the right thing. He lost a lot of things. And like I, they're, the yin and the yang is a great symbol because it really shows the masculine, the feminine, dark, light, all these like, you know what I'm saying? These all these duality of all things sort of. And there's like a dot in each side. Like you need a little bit of every a male needs a little bit of female side to him. Yeah, female, no, absolutely. A hundred percent. Like in uh, the lingam and yoni, um, the altar, the Hindu altar of the lingam, you know what that is? That's like the phallic. It's like a, it's a small altar that people have in their homes. Oh, they yeah, pour yeah, yeah. drink offerings over it. And it's a phallic, you know, penis shape. And then the yoni is a, is a ring that goes around it. That's the female. That's the male and the female. And it's totally phallic for both. They call it a, a vagina. It's called a yoni. So, right. I mean, it's, um, and a penis is called a lingam. I mean, it just deliberately. So, um, the Hindus have a very elaborate theology of that matches the male and the female. And when you, Put them together you see that christianity is not complete it's hostile to all these layers of wisdom and all these feminine aspects of life it's not just that we don't have it it's that they've been overtly stomping on it like trying to get rid of it hard really like with violence yeah. for centuries yeah it's uh, like you're suppressing something and there's something about like the popes and these bishops and like how they how the nuns have to be in to do is they have to do these certain things and dress a certain way and they can't have a and it's something about the structure that's set up that's like screams at you is like control freak like really yeah, absolutely like an authority fear. fetish and, it's and an authority fear. fetish and fear fear of yeah, what fear. Happen to lose that power sin and judgment and condemnation and all this stuff yeah. um but i do want to continue the story because it continues into the bible sure, so on. now as we get into the israelite era so then we have the bronze age collapse um, I don't want to spend too long on this, but this is when Yahweh gets introduced as a reformer. So the Israelites are an existing tribe. They're worshiping all these same, but now we're into Canaan. So the, the names have changed and the pantheon has changed a little bit. So now Ishtar is called Astart. She's got a sister named Anat, who's powerful in her own right. The goddess of like Kali, she's a goddess of death. Um, so she's pretty darn powerful in her own right. Baal is the king of the gods. He's a little bit nasty. They've got child sacrifice. It's admittedly kind of an, it's kind of a gnarly religion. The Canaanite religion is like, in my opinion, with Baal and Anat as your high gods, those, that is a frightening and infant sacrifice in your culture. That is a frightening religion, if you ask me. I can see why they were having a reformation against this particular group because the Phoenician Canaanite religion is like totally gnarly. Like really, really, I think even by the standards of the age, I think the infant sacrifice really, because I don't see that anywhere else. I looked for that, like, there's loads of human sacrifice, shit tons of human sacrifice all over the place for loads of different reasons. But the infant sacrifice is a specific tradition that I only see with the Phoenicians and Canaanites. I don't see that anywhere else. So basically, I only see it with the religion of Baal. I don't mm -hmm. see it anywhere else other than under the regime of Baal. And then Baal goes with Anat, who's like Kali. So this is like, I mean, this is frightening stuff. I mean, they are a frightening mythology. And the Phoenicians, the Greeks and Romans said that the Phoenicians were like really superstitious. Like there was a paradox. It was like kind of a paradox. It reminds me of modern day America. On one hand, they were the most sophisticated people of their day in terms of being artisans and business people. Yeah. And, and explorers and stuff. By far Computers, the most sophisticated. Alphabet, like all types of. But they had this really backwards religion and they were really locked into this old, super superstitious stuff. And this is like America with all these like, Old Testament Bible freaks still like hung up on like these really antiquated ideas, if you ask me. Um, but anyway, so as we shift the story into Canaan and the Israelites, Yahweh wants to have, uh, he's a reformation God. Like he wants to, he wants to take over, he wants to kick Baal off. What Yahweh wants to become the new Lord. He wants to end these traditions of infant sacrifice. He wants to end the idolatry, whether the gods and the stones. And he wants to put these, Kadesha priestesses and these goddess traditions, these, these are mystery religions, basically. Yeah. He wants to put them out of business. He hates them. They want to get rid of them. They want to have the shepherds alone, all Heavenly Father, all the time, no mother goddess, none of that stuff. Because that's what's happening in the cities. That's what's happening in Sodom and Gomorrah when it gets smited by God and blown up to bits, which they think now might have actually been an actual historical comet strike. They may have actually been hit by an asteroid and uh, it cool. actually blown to pieces and like, you know, in that an in antiquity as an actual event, and that they then told stories about them being smited by God, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which to me is like, like, all right, like, but, so I, here, I can see that. 
And here's what I think about that. Because it's an event like that does happen. And it will happen eventually in history. It, and that if it does in a time period like that, where people are already think that all these stuff, all the stuff in the sky is must be the heavens. That's going to be traumatic. And it's going to change everything. They're going to think, what were those people doing? Whatever they were yeah, doing. Right? Can you imagine if New York happened. City got struck by an asteroid, right? And all the conservatives are like, look at the liberal pinko queers they got what they deserved you know they said that about aids you know right. like they would say the same thing if if you know or berlin or some super like liberal cities like some city that or bangkok or something some city that has a reputation for like licentious behavior las vegas or something you know it's yeah. if las vegas got struck by an asteroid all the religious conservatives would say look they got what they deserve right yeah um, um so yeah like i think that like that seems like a realistic if, if that's what the archaeologists say like they can pinpoint you know, an actual asteroid strike at 1300 BC that's like within living memory of these of these cultures. Like I, I, I can imagine it, and I, at least I can imagine them telling stories that way. Like they were smited by God because they were a bunch of, you know, goddess worshippers having orgies all the time. Yeah, because um, like I think these folks knew how to party. Frankly, I think they enjoyed themselves. I think uh, they did a hard day's work and then they drank beer and and uh, had a good time at night. And, and the thing about paganism, it was there's, there's so many different gods that you invoke for certain different reasons. So when you get into a mindset where you're looking at the pagans and you you want to demonize them and you're going to look at, oh, look, they have a god of madness. They have, they have a god of sex. They have a god of love or they have a god of this. Those must be demons then. Those must be evil. They must be worshiping some sort of Satan spirit. Like, you know, and so paganism becomes tainted by that and like the thing about paganism and there's pagans today that talk about this a lot of them don't actually believe in the god itself being literally true but what they are thinking is i'm invoking a self i'm making a self uh promise basically so when i invoke the god of uh i don't know the god of party time all right let's say dionysus when I invoke when I invoke God, uh, the God of Dionysus and I give an offering, what I'm doing is I'm making a pact with my innermost self that I'm going to go out and have a good time and I'm going to enjoy myself and I'm having no fear and I'm going to meet somebody tonight. And, and Dionysus is going to help me do that. Yeah, That's no, I agree. It's like a way to like align yourself with like divine purpose, right? Like whatever that divine purpose is, if it's like to make a bunch of money in banking or if it's to like build a nice house, like the God of carpentry, you know, like I'm going to pray to the God of carpentry for, you know, to help guide my hand. And hopefully that puts you in the frame of mind that you do good carpentry work, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all projections of the human mind to sort of help guide us on our path um, to help like give us our own like light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. It's fascinating. So, okay. So we're going to, next time we, we do this, we're going to get into the bible the the matriarchal side of the of the bible is there anything we want to touch on well if we're going to wrap it up here then we'll then we'll start the next time with king solomon because yeah. that becomes the next piece he's the next linchpin in the story he's a central figure in the whole thing because he what king solomon does is he worships the goddesses the bible is abundantly clear about this they criticize him very harshly he loves women he engages in all this sensuous behavior um and so but he, and he sits in a lion throne, all this stuff. But he's the one who, he's the father of the wisdom traditions. And he is the one who transmutes these pagan imagery of the goddesses in nature and stuff. He's the one who transmutes it all into wisdom and calling wisdom she. And he writes in Proverbs how wisdom calls out and she is, you know, greater than gold and everything. Um, and that's my favorite part of the Bible, mind you, is Pro this books by King Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs are... To me, the three best books in the Old Testament by a mile. Um, and he is the one who, who creates this tradition that becomes Sophia and that becomes the Shekinah um, and all these aspects in Sophia for the Gnostics. Like all that comes from King Solomon. And he is the one who is like takes the divine feminine from these unacceptable images of sex to, and, and plants to what is an acceptable vision of wisdom. And I guess that'll be next chapter. Yeah, and that's exactly what I we're, we're leading up to is how, and I want to touch on Sophia too. So that's going to be because Sophia is a huge part of Gnosticism. 
There are yeah. many different creation myths in Gnosticism, but I'm going to go with Justin the Gnostic, who says that the Demiurge and Sophia gave birth to the world. And so you have this half male, uh, which is like the void. Like the, Isn't the Demiurge the lower god, or is the monad? Well, here's the thing. There's so many creation myths in, in Gnosticism that the monad is like the, 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 um, the pleroma. He's is he's, the, uh, he's L, right? He's the high god. Yeah, the highest and of all. Is Yahweh. He's not even really a deity. He's everything. He's the all. That's what the right, monad. Okay. Everything comes from the monad. That's what the um the chaos. He's like the chaos serpent eating its own tail. But um, then you got Abraxas, who's like the hero archetype, and then you got Sophia, wisdom. So, okay. but Justin the Gnostic, he has his own creation account where the Demiurge and Sophia were there in the beginning. They're they're both endless and timeless. And they're both equally powerful, and they they uh created the world together. So that's like it's and that's why I was actually talking to um D Dr. Carrier on my show, and he said Nazis. Yeah, watch your video a, with him. Yeah, Nazis is not a real thing. It's it's just a word that we use to describe a whole bunch of different things that don't align with each other. That's why you said you're like, wait a minute, isn't the Gnostic? Isn't the Demiurge? You're right. That's how many. Right, right. That's how many different cultures. Right, it's an, it's an umbrella term like Indians. Like, yeah, to use exactly. the term Indian for all of Native American tribes. There's like how many different tribes? How many different cultures? Like, who knows? But like to call them all, we just call them all Indians. Just sort of a lump. Great all example. That was a great example. Exactly. So, but that that's what we can touch on. We can get into Solomon, and then because in in the Bible, who is he invoking? Sophia. He's literally saying Sophia, like her. It's always meant. It's never like he never uses the term Sophia, though. That that term comes later. The Sophia doesn't actually show up in the Bible, I don't think. No, in the Septuagint, in the Greek. Oh, the Greek, yeah, the Greek, the Greek, not the Hebrew. The Hebrew, it's it's um, uh, it's uh, it's what is it? Kamash or uh, what is it? Um, uh, Chakma. It's so is that is that what it is? Is Sophia is just the Greek translation of the word Sophia wisdom? Sophia is the word wisdom in Greek. So if you're if you're reading, okay. I'm sorry, you're right. I should have clarified. If you have the Greek Old Testament and you're reading Solomon, Song of Solomon, or Proverbs, or Ecclesiastes, which is all attributed to Solomon, it's all like sort of Solomon type stuff. Or there's a book called Sophia. It's called we and our, we see it. It's called Wisdom, but the original version in Greek is called Sophia, and wow. it's Solomon talking to Sophia, asking her for wisdom, saying, "I'm a lover of wisdom," and then he's but there's so many. I can't wait to do this episode next week because I'm going to have all those. Well, I'm going to have, I'm going to make a list of all the times where he literally names off Sophia as being all powerful. You'd only, you only see that word all powerful a, a couple of times in the Bible. It's always attributed to Yahweh. Oh yeah. I'll prepare some stuff for next week too. We can actually, we sure. can be a little more prepared next week. Um, yeah. Cause like the wisdom of Solomon that comes from the Apocrypha, that's got some really cool parts in it too. I put that at the end of my book um, yeah. at the very end. There's so if you're reading name. that in Greek, you would see you would you would literally read the Sophia of Solomon. Uh, see that? Uh, see how different it is once you when you switch the language up. It's like a different. You're like entering a new code in the system, and it and it renders a whole different answer. It right. Really so the, the, yeah. So the one I quote is the book I call it "The Wisdom of Solomon," and it's in the Apocrypha. And is that the same one you're talking about? Yes. It would be called Sophia. All right. Gotcha. Yeah, Sophia. Yep. That's yeah, the book. Well, yeah. It's actually I called learned both what is secret and what is manifest for wisdom, the fashioner of all things taught me. For in her there is a spirit that is intelligent. Hang on. Pause, holy, pause. unique, manifold. Pause. Oh, read that so again. Beautiful. No, read that again. But instead of wisdom, say Sophia. Now listen gotcha. to how it sounds. All right, all right. Yep. I learned both what is secret and what is manifest. For Sophia, the fashioner of all things, taught me. For in her there is a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle mobile clear unpolluted distinct invulnerable loving the good keen irresistible beneficent humane steadfast sure free from anxiety all powerful overseeing all and penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent and pure and most subtle for wisdom for sophia yeah, is yeah. more mobile than any motion because of her pureness she pervades and penetrates all things for she is a breath of the power of god and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her, for she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of his goodness. 
Though she is but one, she can do all things. And while remaining in herself, she renews all things. In every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. For God loves nothing so much as the man who loves with Sophia. For she is more beautiful than the sun and excels every constellation of the stars. Compared with the light, she is found to be superior. For it is succeeded by the night, but against Sophia, evil does not prevail. Doesn't that, make sense? Doesn't that make sense when you say it that way? <laughs> yeah, I, I love that passage, man. I think that passage is, is awesome, man. It's based at Solomon basically saying Sophia is the God of all things. Like she's the all powerful. That, there's, there's, there's my. That's why the Bible still's got some value for us. Yeah, even yeah. enough for us. And every Catholic Gnostic, Bible, every Catholic Bible has that in there. The yeah, it's in the apocrypha. No, yeah, but the every Catholic Bible that's canon to them. Tell me that's and now it makes sense. Now all of a sudden Catholic Catholicism makes sense why they have the Mother Mary, why they do that the whole entire that aspect. Oh yeah, the Virgin now Mary it all is makes the best part of Catholicism. That's what I'm trying to get at. It's like there's a reason why it's all there. It's a and I think it's a big mistake that the Protestants knocked her out. Right. The Protestants are like Absolutely. They were totally right to point out that Virgin Mary is just like a once removed pagan goddess. Right. But they were wrong to say let's get rid of her. What we should have done is elevate her back up to her proper placeage. And and that's what and we're that's doing it. now. And that's, it's perspective, it, 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 you know, depending on how you look at it. But it's they're they're both valid. They're both equally as valid. So you have just attained true gnosis and going by the book Amazon. <laughs>